You're listening to a podcast from The Word. Okay, Mark, stack waddy game. Go cool. uh, I'm sure you'd agree with me that there is a, there's a kind of tide in the naming of bands, isn't there? You know, yeah. At any given time in musical history, there seems to be an unspoken agreement as to what sort of name is desirable for a certain sort of band. You know, so, so if you go back and you look at, you know, at Motown, they all had kind of magical, sparkly names, didn't they? Like the Temptations, yep. the Supremes, the Miracles, the Marvelettes. In the 60s, beat groups had kind of, I suppose what you call anthropomorphic names, wouldn't you? Like the beat The animals. Groups, the monkeys, the animals. The monkeys, the, the, the birds. beetles, yep. yeah. And in the late 60s, you started getting those names which are ironic juxtapositions of adjectives and nouns, like Iron Butterfly. Grateful Dead. I suppose so, yeah. Heavy yeah. Jelly, Mighty Baby, Iron yeah, Butterfly, yeah. Led Zeppelin. And then there was, there was uh, all those post-punk names like Southern Death Cult and Gang of Four and, you know, Joy Division. All those names which seem to say, you know, we're really serious. You wouldn't believe just how serious we are. We're dead yeah. serious. Anyway, bring it up to date. Right now, we seem to be passing through a period where bands have names which are deliberately mundane, it seems to me. And the first time in rock history, names that are deliberately mundane. Elbow. So, <laughs> so mundane that yeah. they defy you to have any expectations with you. They, they, their names are so mundane, you might think they can't really be band names at all, Mark. So here here are a number of them. This okay. is good. This is very good. Okay. Yeah. There are six of so them. I've got here. to spot what, the real ones or the, the ring? No, there are six here. One is not a real name of a band. Okay. Yet. But the other ones are. Okay. <laughs> yet. Here we go. It's only a question of time. It's only a question of time. Okay, Mark Allen, here you go. Here's your six. Jockstrap. First aid kit. Dry cleaning. Small feet. Diarrhea planet and thermos. Okay? <laughs> Jockstrap. So, well, you're saying that out of those six, five of them are real? Absolutely. Wow. Five of those that are That is real. absolutely fantastic. Okay. Well, first aid kit, I know are real because I, I, I'm a great admirer of first aid kit. Okay. There is. So that's, they're real. Small feet, I'm suggesting, must be real because it's a pun on... On little feet, I don't know it possibly. So I think I, that I don't know is. if it's I don't know if it's a pun on little feet, but but they are interestingly enough. Uh, the first aid kit, kit come from Sweden, and uh, small feet also come from Sweden. From, Maybe okay. it's a Swedish joke. Maybe it, it's really funny. It might funny. be. Anyway, it might be. Carry on. Um, jockstrap. That feels real to me too. I don't know why. It's just uh, it's 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 plausible. As are thermos. Uh, that uh, that 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 sounds uh, extremely likely. Diarrhea planet m must be real because you wouldn't have made it up, and therefore there is obviously somewhere in Essex or whatever kind of an indie kind of <laughs> slightly aggressive metallic group called Diarrhea Planet. I'm saying the answer must be dry cleaning because it's so so unutterably boring. That it has to be the right answer. So, Dry Cleaning are an English post punk band who formed no. in South London in 2018. There you go. Uh, no, no, no. There, yes. So you're Which is the ringer? The ringer is Thermos. No, thermos. thermos. I checked it in myself. Thermos Jock is so good. Jockstrap. It's very John Peel. And of course, later Thermos. Jockstrap are an English musical duo consisting of Georgia Ellery and Taylor Sky. They've all got these classic names, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, first, yeah. First aid kit, Swedish folk duo. Dry cleaning, English post punk band forms in South London. Uh, small feet come from Stockholm. Diarrhea Planet, uh, American six piece gar garage punk band from Nashville, Tennessee. The one I made up is Thermos. It's thermos. I win! You win! <laughs> Deservedly so. That's brilliant. The Word Podcast. Fix yourself a drink and it's like being in the pub. So Jerry Lee Lewis uh, has finally gone to meet his maker. My Lord. M much to applaud, much to deplore. <laughs> I know said, it's a fantastic story, isn't it? I was, talking to, I was talking to somebody last night who said that they'd heard him being discussed on the radio. I don't know if it was Radio 4 probably or so. Of course, you have to remember he's a paedophile. It's just like, oh, God's sake. Uh, 
Yeah. I know, I know. It's so <laughs> so difficult to discuss. Isn't it? <laughs> People have been strong. posting pictures of him with his thirteen year old wife, just sort of saying this is a kind of criminal. And I mean, yeah, of course they're, they're kind of right. But I mean, you know, it's it's uh, we've got to stand outside it and just look at it as being the story of Jerry Lee Lewis, have not we? It's, uh, it's extraordinary because when I wrote my book about uh, holds up book, uncommon people, the rise and fall of the rock star, in whenever I wrote it, I don't know, two thousand and seventeen or something, something like that. I, 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 at that point, four of the greats of 50s rock and roll were still alive. Uh, and they were Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah. And, uh, and I think they've died in that order, actually. I think they have. He was, he was the last one standing, was the wasn't last he? one. And, uh, you couldn't believe that he was still alive, actually. Not just because um, of the kind of... You know, the kind of medical disasters he'd sustained. But also, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose you just expected him to have died. But but he, he, 87 is actually quite young, I thought, comparatively young. He's only five years y- older than John Lennon, wasn't he? I, and yet I, those guys seemed a completely different generation. I they? suppose so, because they started so young, didn't they? Yeah, they yeah. did. I mean, yeah. Jerry, Jerry Lee was kind of sort of discovered when he was mid-teens, really. Yeah. He was a kind of insane talent you know and i think also it's interesting comparing him with those those other those other three great 50s rock and rollers i think he probably had more equipment than the rest of them actually you know because he was he was an absolute master of, it, of, an, of an instrument from a very early age. He could play absolutely anything. Play anything and, and played up to eight hours a day, didn't he? I mean, yeah. Absolutely astonishing. And fantastic skill. singer all the way through his recording career. I was trying and, to work out what it was that made him different. What do you think it was? Because I think part of it was just a technical thing that he, he played the kind of boogie woogie bass lines with his left hand, but he also had a bass guitarist. So he had a kind of double bass running through his songs, which gave it a fantastically strong foundation, I think. I think also just the the sheer vocal personality. Yeah, you know the, the, this this great kind of insouciant way of delivering lyrics. You know what I mean? That that they, his hands would be going wild down there, but he's uh, you know his, his head and shoulders will be still, kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're, we're delivering things with absolutely extraordinary slickness, and. Um, He's absolutely just, he was remarkable. You know, he was first taken to New York. Well, he was fined by Sam Phillips, I think, and, and took him to New York trying to go on a Steve Allen show. And, Which and kind of made him, didn't it? It was made him. And Steve Allen can pretty much gave him $500 and say, I'll give you $500 yeah. if you don't show him to anybody else. Don't go anywhere else, that's right. So it was like he was a... It was, a, it was a gimmick act, almost. You know, here's this young guy who can just play and sing like you, you wouldn't believe. And, uh, you know, it was Steve Allen, it was Steve Allen's exposure on the Steve Allen show that that, that made him. And uh, he named one of his children after Steve Allen. Did I he? Think. Yes, one of his children who tragically died. I mean, you know, he's... His personal life was... Oh, it's astonishing. All kinds of... Um... It, one of his children died age three, I think, drowned in a swimming pool. So another one died, one of his... Another son died when he was 19 in a car crash. I mean, the things... Uh, you know, his brother was killed by a drunk driver when he yeah. was young, wasn't yeah. he? I mean, just the catalogue of woe. I mean, these are wild men who living out... <laughs> These were wild men living out in the woods, were they? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the interesting thing about... People with rifles above the door. About about all those guys, you know, particularly Little Richard Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee and Lentor, they came from a part of America that the rest of America didn't know anything about at all, actually. And they came from a part that lived a totally different yeah. kind of life. And a reckless disregard for personal safety... It, propriety, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know standard uh, standard attitudes to marriage, all those kind of things. They 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 they, was a, they, they were a different tribe. These completely people completely different attitudes and uh, proper rednecks. A lot of other people pretend to be rednecks. He really was the real thing, wasn't he? And the, the other thing about particularly him again, Little Richard and Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee, they grew up in a world where the main entertainers they saw were preachers. You know, so they were all, they all belonged to kind of Pentecostal churches, strange sects, whatever, and would be taken by their mothers and fathers, and, you know, and pretty much sort of tent shows, you know. Yeah. Where 
and preachers were showmen. You know, yeah. they, 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 they spoke in tongues, you know, they were transported, they did tricks. And so, so much of what somebody like Jerry Lee learned was he learned from that, that side of things, you know. And so there was always that kind of... Um, that you conflict. were transporting yourself and your audience to another place. And also that conflict, it was the devil's music, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then very often what the things they were were singing were kind of, you know, secular adaptations of uh, of gospel songs. And they could all sit down at the piano and just play old, old gospel tunes, stuff that they learned at their mother's knee. And it was just really powerful in them at all stages. Of course, Jerry Lee and uh, w- was... Probably, arguably, more reckless than the rest of them, which is which is saying something. Which is when, yeah, quite quite a high bar when you, there. When you consider Little Richard was amongst the the rest of them, and you know, Jerry Lee wouldn't couldn't be told any by by anybody at any stage in his career, you know, that you should avoid this particular policy. It's probably not a good idea. Which is which was his undoing, wasn't it, in 1958 when he came to England? Because didn't Sam Phillips say to him, "Do not go." Do not go to England with your thirteen-year-old wife. I mean, I mean they, the marital that, history is just is just worth recapping. We should here. go through the seven wives of Jerry Lee Lewis, <laughs> actually. For, didn't, no, no, didn't he marry the first one, Dorothy Barton? Didn't he marry her when he was fifteen and she was seventeen? Yeah. So yeah, and then then, and the, then then he bigamously married, while married to Dorothy Barton, Jane Mitchum became pregnant. And, he, and after three days in jail for, for, for stealing a gun, I think, and store breaking, he got out and then married her, although still married to the first one. There you Am I go. right? There you go. And then when he married then, the, third, the third one, he had he had failed to properly detach himself from the second one. And the first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I think he'd already got rid oh, of he had, was he? Oh, OK. I think he was only bigamously bigger, married once. Uh, oh, OK. Uh, to okay. two different women. Yeah, company. yeah. Uh, so the third one was, of course, the legendary Myra. Who, and the interesting thing was she was the daughter of his bass player, is that right? The guy who played in his band. Yeah, and so he'd split up with the second wife, went to live with the bass player. And I'm just trying to imagine this this relationship developing. I mean, I'm just going to go, I can't get my head around it, really. Well, that's anyway. good. Give you an idea of what a vanished world we're dealing with. Yeah, there. yeah. So he married Myra and then was due to come to, Lo- to London to tour with the band, including Myra's father. They arrive at Heathrow, and in those days, you, you kind of had to do some kind of press conference at Heathrow. You know, there'd be a load of chaps with uh, notebooks and probably with, the, with press tickets in their hat bands, you know, yeah. carrying large cameras. Uh, all standing around trying to get a news angle on Jerry Lee. And uh, a chap from the Daily Express spots this uh, young girl at the back of the crowd and sidles over and says, and who are you, dear? And she says, foolishly, because she could have said, my dad's the bass player. My dad's the bass player. She didn't. She said, I'm Jerry Lee's wife. And they looked at her and said, how old are you? And she said... 15. Yeah, she originally realised that she maybe had done something wrong. And which was wrong because yeah. she wasn't 15. She was, she was 13. 13. And by the time they got to the Westbury Hotel just off Bond Street, which is where they were staying, all hell had, you know, broken loose. Press conferences. <laughs> and Jerry Lee was, was having to field it. And Jerry Lee was But with not... no PR, yeah, nobody kind of advising or protecting no. him, did he? he was just like... And didn't they say something like, uh, is she old enough to marry you? And I think his response was, well, just look at her. There you Isn't go. That right? So this is not helping, is it? It's not helping at all. No. So the tour starts. He plays, I think, Edmonton, uh, the Edmonton Regal or whatever was the, cin- the cinema in Edmonton. Among the crowd was the young Harry Webb, who was, of course, with Cliff yeah. Richard. And uh, and the tour didn't get far, very far at all. It just had to be called off because there was such a such a hue and cry, and uh, and the agents saw you know putting on the concerts with the Grades, you know Michael Grades' father and uncle and so forth, and Jerry Lee had to beat it back to the United States, um, leaving his uh, his uh, representative in England to try and get the money because it was a long tour. It was a thirty date tour or something. Yeah. So it would have been $100,000 or something of that nature. 
and uh, never got it. And Jerry Lee went back to the States. And his career took years to recover. Because yeah. you know, do you know what his next single was due in the United States? High School Confidential. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you can imagine, that. no, that's not a very good idea at all. And so he kind of couldn't get arrested for, for years, really. Yeah. Um, and but but he, I, I've just I was playing this yesterday. But also he wasn't he wasn't penitent, was he? I mean, he, you know, he did these dreadful oh. things to these women and just you know t- appalling life. But he never apologised. He never thought he'd done anything wrong. Well, this is a man. Don't forget, who was called the killer when he was at school. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and he he used to you know, he used to like to propagate his own myth. He was the man who said, I was born standing up with a hard on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so, anyway, he I, I was playing this yesterday. Do you know this record? Jerry Lee Lewis Live at the Hamburg Star Club from 1960. Oh, I was just playing it the other day. It's fantastic. It's unbelievable. He, it's really, really, it's all the rock and roll standards, isn't it? Played in, in 1964 at Long the Star Club. Long Tall Sally, yeah. Uh, with backed by three members of the Nashville teens, um, Barry Jenkins, the drummer and uh, and the bass player and the guitarist, and uh, it's an absolutely sensational rock and roll album. But of course, kind of passed unnoticed at the time because it was all it was you know, Beatlemania and all, yeah. all that kind of thing. So Jerry Lee didn't really didn't really make his comeback musically until the late sixties. With the country records, you know, which he kind of reinvented himself as a, as a as a barroom country singer, and so that you know the likes of what made Milwaukee famous made a loser out of me, uh, which Rod Stewart famously did, didn't he, on one of his. Um, but with the was the country one just more forgiving of his reputation because he is the one of the first examples of somebody's career being kind of cancelled, really, isn't it? I suppose so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously, he was he was rediscovered by the country audience. But the odd thing about the, the country records, you know, you just have to look, to look at the titles. What were made Milwaukee famous made a loser out of me. Uh, she still comes round to love what's left of me, <laughs> which is my fav- my favourite. And um, do you know that song Thirty Nine and Holding? Yeah. <laughs> It's all about about a guy who's clearly in middle age, but as far as the outside world is concerned, you know the 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 dim lights hide the marriage. Uh, no, the dim lights hide the mileage lines. The clairol hides the grey, and he's not into anything that gives his age away. He's thirty nine and holding, wonderful, holding, holding everything he can. <laughs> he he wrote. He did, well, he did all these songs. He, he didn't write them mostly. They were given to him by really good Nashville songwriters. But he he had this position of a kind of ruefulness, you know, that all these songs were, I've screwed up, I've done terrible things, she walked out on me. Yeah. Know, all this, you know, she's having an affair behind my back, all this kind of thing. But all that stuff was completely at odds with his actual personal life because he was never apologetic at all in his personal life, you know. So he carried on with the marriages, didn't he? And so, you know, Myra, he didn't divorce... uh, Myra didn't divorce him until 10 years later or something like that. And uh, and then he he got married a further four times. He got married, yeah, he did. I know his fourth wife, who died, J- Jaron Pate, I think, who died in a b- t- swimming pool in an accident or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Like. And uh, just terrible. And then the fifth wife, who 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 died, I think, of an overdose. Uh, Sean Stephen. Yeah. And there was a general suggestion that he might have, in some way, have been responsible, wasn't it? Do you Rolling that? Stone ran a big story. Rolling Stone, yeah. To that, to to that, um, to that effect. Saying that traces of her blood were, you know, on his dressing gown and so forth, and that there were, uh, that there was never, it was never properly investigated. Yeah, because you're dealing with kind of, I don't know, rural Mississippi or whatever, <laughs> where you, I don't know. Uh, but he, he clearly always denied it and so forth. But then got married a, a, a further twice. So twice. Well, Kerry Kerry McCarver, I think, who is the girl when he was. His property was seized by the IRS, wasn't it? He had to move as a tax exile to Ireland. And actually, that I mean, that wedding, that marriage lasted a long time, like 21 years or whatever. And then he got married again to a woman who I only just recently discovered. She was called Judith Brown, and she was the wife of the brother of 
the 13 year old girl that he married Myra. Oh, so they were related. I mean, not, not related, I mean, d- d- very distantly related by marriage. But yeah, he was his former wife's brother's ex wife that he married, uh, Judith Brown. Extraordinary. We shall not see his like again, which is probably a good job. <laughs> it is a good thing. You're listening to The Word Podcast, where the time is whenever you want it to be. OK, we welcome another birthday guest, a much-valued Patreon supporter, Giles Fraser. Hello, Giles. Hello, good morning to you all. Well, nice Giles, happy birthday. Third time, right? It's your third time we've had you on a I birthday know. slot, I think. It's, it's, you. it's your third word birthday. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. How, have, you, have you had the birthday, and if so, how is it celebrated? It was Tuesday. Uh-huh. had a busy month, actually. His birthday took a little bit of backseat to my eldest daughter's wedding at the beginning of October. Oh, oh wow, and, uh, exciting. Everyone's emotional and logistical and physical juices, I think. But, uh, yes, I had a lovely birthday, thanks. Really Very nice. good. Good to you. Brilliant. Now, you, you've got a question or some yeah, questions. Well, it's Go not really on. a question. It's more, it's more like a parlour game, isn't it? All right, okay. So what I, what I was thinking was, if you had to create a school and you had to get all the teachers... Uh, to be recruited from the world of music, who would they be? And I was thinking the categories are head of science, head of English, head of art, matron, and headmaster or mistress. Right. And I have that's to- really good. I'd love, I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. All okay. right, go on. Are you ready? Uh, head of art. Did you say yeah. art? He's yes. art. He's obviously Brian Ferry. Brian Ferry works. Oh, okay. He was a pottery teacher, wasn't he? A Holland Park Comprehensive. Uh, Very two, good. He's yeah. got previous there. Yeah. Head of science is obviously Thomas Dolby. Yeah, I've got Thomas Dolby. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. going right. to be. Blind move science. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Head of English, possibly a slightly left field here, Richard Thompson. Oh, Richard that's Thompson. Good. Oh, I like that. Very, very good. well read. And he's yeah. probably he's probably got a corduroy jacket with leather elbow patches somewhere yeah. in his wardrobe. So he's. Uh, so he's Rollies, all... do you think? Yeah, yeah. Outside the door when um, they're doing his homework. Matron is clearly Claire Grogan. I won't go any further oh. on that. <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's a good yeah. one. And um, I don't know, head head teacher. Head teacher's main job is to impress the parents. They have to have somebody who can kind of who, who look impressive and kind yeah. of. Uh, and I'm not quite clear who that would be really. But anyway, right. so those are mine. Okay. Anyway, oh, well, I think head teacher. Head teacher. I think Sting. I don't know why I think he looks like oh. a head teacher. Oh, they, they, the the mother. Uh, he's would got love him. that kind of statesmanlike. Uh, yeah. Okay. Look about him, okay. Yeah. Headmistress. I think Annie Lennox. I don't know. She's got a right. faint. Uh, tinge of that kind of uh, pride of Miss Jean Brody. Miss Jean Brody. And also, Brody. No, of... Miss Jean Brody. And Brian Eno, I think head of art, actually. Yeah, definitely Tom oh. Dolby. Head of English, I couldn't think of an English person. I was thinking of, of Donald Fagan. But actually, I oh. think because of he's so erudite and just so funny, the words that they uh, he cooked up in those Steely Dan yeah. songs. But I think you're probably right. Matron, I'm saying Lulu, actually. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Claire, Claire Grogan is a really good choice. Yeah. <laughs> That's what brilliant. about you, Giles? Okay, so I had well, it, I had Eno as head of science. Oh, well, there you oh, go. Oh, good. Because I think he's very curious, and I think apart from his experiment of drinking his own urine, I think his experiments would be very interesting. Okay. All right. English, I had Ray Davis. Okay. I think he's one of our finest wordsmiths. Yeah, right. He would be quite inspiring. Head art, head of art, I had Joni Mitchell. Oh, oh right. very good. Yes. Be, I think she would run a good art class. Very. Emphatic. She would. Very positive, but also does it herself. So, yeah, uh, yeah that's right, good. Right, matron. I actually, for I was fiddling with this, and I was for quite some time thinking Claire Grogan. And I thought <laughs> that, I think you might be thinking that for the wrong reasons, Giles. So <laughs> I had Tina Weymouth. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think she's she would be very nice. She'd be very caring, but I think she'd be quite firm as well. Okay, yeah, right. quite firm. You can't give everyone all the drugs they want all the no, time. No, yeah, get your time. Veruca sorted out and then get <laughs> out of here. Right, yeah. and head myth, house, master, or mister. I have one person, and I had someone who's very successful, hardworking, ambitious but humble, no nonsense, experience of running a large organization, Dolly Parton. Oh, very good. Very yes. Good. Very good. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's the winner, actually. I think we've good got the, that's the ideal. Yeah, uh, you've won. So. won. So that was my, that was my little two penny worth on that. Oh, and Superb. I did have, I'll tell you, for head miss, headmaster, I did toy with Bruce Springsteen for quite some time. I thought about that. But yeah. I think he needs to be head of woodwork. And Bruce Springsteen should be head of woodwork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. Fine. 
Yeah. Well, look, Giles, nice to talk. Nice to see you. you. Very good. Nice very to mark your birthday. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to next year. The Word Podcast, one of the few things you really need in life. And we're joined uh, yet again. This is uh, more than his first time round uh, for another birthday special with uh, with Ian Martin. Ian, very nice to see you. Happy birthday! And uh, I think you've got you've got some kind of log to chuck on our fire. I think, haven't you? In yeah, terms of a, no, of a question. I, I, yeah, thank you, thank you for having me, and, and thanks for keeping me entertained for last year too. So, um, yeah, I, I've been to two concerts in the last. Well, two or three weeks. I went to see Bob Dylan at the London Palladium, and I, I know that you guys are connoisseurs on Bob Dylan, but I love him. I, yeah, I, I've never seen him live. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> I, I'm probably the only person in, in in this this group that's never listened to Blood on the Tracks. My my favourite Bob Dylan album is Desire. All oh, right. Okay. Um, and I went to see him at the Palladium in the Rough and Rowdy tour, and it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, yeah. he he's I didn't know a single song that he played. Um, it, I think it was based on some of the newer albums. Well, it's nine uh, of the ten tracks on the new album. Then about five yeah. or six old ones, isn't it? Which you and probably then didn't some re- reworkings of of uh, some of his other songs. But I have to say, it was a wonderful evening, and the Palladium was was a nice setting for him. Yeah. The staging was good. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that that's sort of kind of like one end of the nostalgia circuit. And uh, then last night uh, when I got back from the airport, I went to see The Damned. Oh wow! <laughs> The original lineup who, who have a combined age of 269. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. And, and I believe that, that their, their relationship uh, in the early days was less than harmonious. I, I think one or two of them were only in the band for 18 months. Right. Um, and they produced in, in their career of the original lineup uh, just over an hour of music on two, two albums, one of which failed to make the top 100, and the other one charted at number 34 and yet they sold out two nights at the Hammersmith Apollo oh. um, and and the, where Bob Dylan was recreating a new sound um, and, and taking his music forward you know the damned were really trying to recreate 1976 it, it, it was it was a real contrast of, yeah. of, of, of evenings and even though I'm, I would put myself down as a damned fan I found the Bob Dylan thing far more interesting and it's probably braver to, to you know, carry on doing that. I, I don't know what your views on... Well, on with it. Dylan, the thing I, I feel with Dylan is I don't want him to play the early stuff. I, I don't want him to because the way he plays it is not how I remember it and not how I connect with it. I'd much rather he played the new stuff because he yeah. plays it authentically as, as, the, yeah. as the way it appeared on the record. So that suits me fine. With The Damned, I would only really want to see them uh, reactivating 1976, 77. So you'd win both ways. Perfect. Yeah, and also... Not- I yeah. mean, how, how old are the damned? The damned must be in the, in the, be in the late 60s. 68, 67, I would have thought. <laughs> I think they're they're about 68. Their, their combined ages of the four of them was 269. Right. So, so they're, all, they're all about 70. How do you play neat, neat, neat when you're 70? Yeah. I don't, slower. Slower, <laughs> surely, you know. Whereas Bob Dylan's always been, he's been into a stately pace for a long time, hasn't he? But he also has that awe of being an icon or a legend. I know those are overused words. Yeah. Where you know, when I was walking up to Palladium, there was probably four hundred people around the stage door, just hoping, waiting yeah. for him to come to the venue, <laughs> looking for a hooded figure to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that they're not going to see at all. Yeah. yeah. So you you're wondering who's the eldest band we've seen. Yeah, I just wonder who is the oldest band that, of the original lineup that could reform and actually. Oh, still, oh, the original lineup. Still, okay, well, might be the zombies for me, but I don't know if it was entirely the original lineup. And actually, it was it was about twelve years ago? So, so that meant that they weren't that old, really. I mean, they would only have been in their I don't know late sixties, early seventies, whatever. I tell you what struck me. I saw, and I was thinking about this this weekend because there's a new documentary on Netflix. I think it is about him which is louis armstrong and and which one of my daughters was watching and i said well i actually saw louis armstrong in 1967 wow. and uh, and th- so that was his last tour of britain obviously and he played with the all stars who were a bunch of musicians that kind of some of them went back and whatever and they're all quite old and and i've just been looking it up prior to this conversation and I think they were younger 
than the members of U2 are nowadays. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah and that Probably, was it. Yeah. in the late 60s. You know, he died in, he died in 71 and he died in his 60s. You know, because that's that's the age people died at in yeah. those days. You know, it's simple life expectancy thing. Whereas you look at a group like U2 who don't need to reform because they're still there. They're all in the late 60s. Within sight of the 70s. Mid 60s. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely extraordinary. So, you know. It, it, it is, and there's a market for it. You, you know, that either people oh, yeah. want to relive their faded memory or um, just wanted to go, like me, when I went to see Bob Dylan to go and see a legend. Yeah, yeah. Well, well the thing about Bob Dylan is he wants to keep doing it, doesn't he? Yeah. It's, it doesn't need the money, it just needs the life. You know, that's... Uh, and it's so good that you went to see him now because there would have been periods, you know, certainly the early 80s, and I've seen him right the way through, really, uh, the early 80s when it was pretty dire, but you've picked a good time to... to <laughs> well, I, I went with low expectations because everybody said he, he can be variable at best. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I thought it was consistent. It, and he would really thought about the show. I know he sits behind the piano, but he is yeah. 81. Yeah. Um, but he he had really thought about how to communicate the this music in this venue to these people, and he's talking to the audience too. He's actually talking. Yeah. He played in Nottingham the other night, the night that Jerry Lee Lewis died, and he played a Jerry Lee Lewis song. And a little thing about uh, you know uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis will never die. We all know that. And he played. Uh, I think as I can't seem to say goodbye. It's really really fantastic. Yeah. Oh well, very good. Oh well, so you know, it's never too late to start with Bob Dylan. That's uh, that's the, the learning from no, no, no. the carry out. Life, life goes on. That's, that's yeah, it. yeah. Well, look, Ian, nice to hear from you. Uh, yeah. Nice you to mark you, yourselves. Yeah, nice to mark your birthday. We'll see you next year. See you next year. Yeah. The Word Podcast: Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. So it's fifty years since the release of this holds up copy of Stevie Wonder's Talking Book which is the record that, um, I suppose, re launched the second phase of Stevie Wonder's career. Uh, you, know, you know, people talk about reinvention. <laughs> that, that, was the, that was the ultimate case of reinvention, wasn't it? It was. Because he'd been little Stevie Wonder, you know, the 12-year-old the boy genius, whatever, you know, playing the harmonica and fingertips and I was made to love her and all these fantastically kind of zesty pop hits and then well he, he was 21 uh he reached i know he's 20 that's the extraordinary thing isn't it? he was 21 <laughs> and i think at that stage he said look i want to have complete control over my well music. that's when to... that's when he you know he, that was that was his he reached his age of majority in terms of his deal with motown so he could yeah. do what he liked yeah. he could go somewhere else he could be in charge he chose not to go anywhere else, actually. Interesting. But they let him just be in charge of the whole thing, and he finished up playing pretty much all the instruments, apart from congas and guitars, I think, didn't he? All the drums, all the keyboards, all the vocal, everything like that. And then uh, uh, and, 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 and got it paid off because it was the beginning of a series of five albums of just unbelievable success. I just couldn't get over how young he was and also how prolific because the, um, the, 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 the Tonto, the Tonto um, synthesizer... Yeah. Is a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah. With the guys who were from Tonto's expanding headband, Malcolm Cecil and Robert uh, Margolif. And I was just reading about it and how he had an experimental weekend with them trying out this synthesizer. And in that, th I think it was two or three days, wrote 17 songs. Absolutely astonishing. He would turn up when he toured with the Stones in 1972. He would turn up every time at the soundcheck with a new song he'd just written yeah. and soundcheck yeah. that new song. I mean, he was just so prolific. It's extraordinary. And, uh, and, of course, the great thing about Tonto is Robert Margolef and Malcolm Cecil. And Malcolm Cecil was, uh, was British and was uh, a member of, uh, well, he played in the Tubby Hayes at the, uh, Jazz Warriors yeah. in, in the 50s and then was a kind of founding member of, um, of Blues Incorporated, you know, with kind of Alexis Corner and... And all those guys, yeah. And then went to the United States and uh, did loads of things. And then he and uh, Robert Margolev developed the first 
first polyphonic synthesizer, which was the size of a kind of aircraft carrier, pretty much, you know, and uh, and they introduced Stevie Wonder to it. And Stevie Wonder couldn't believe it because suddenly he didn't have to kind of give instructions to musicians. He pretty much, he could play any sound, that, you know, that came into his head straight onto this thing. And it is a remarkable record in all kinds of ways. I think, uh, this may be a bold statement, I think, you know, people always talk about records being influential. They talk about records being great, being influential, being iconic, being legendary or whatever, as if all those things meant the same thing. They don't, you know. The thing about Talking Book was it wasn't just massively successful. It was also hugely influential because so many, you know, African-American musicians particularly looked at that and thought, I want to do that. I want to make a record like that that just comes out of my head rather than something that comes from a load of songs that the that the publisher has delivered for me, you know, because that was the yeah. that was the standard format of a Motown record, you know, for for most of the 60s, you know, that you did a you did show tunes or you did a Beatles song or you did whatever. So Marvin Gaye's What's Going On was made in 1971, and the album would never have been made if the single hadn't been an enormous number one hit in the United States. And so Barry Gordy said, where's the album? So they, they went off and did it. Whereas Talking Book is, is different. That was that was made as an album, you know, and um, it was uh, supposed to be a total statement. And, of course, you know, all the things that, that we now just suddenly take for granted... The image on the cover was so revolutionary. It was. <laughs> that here he is, well, he, a, a, allegedly in Africa, really, isn't he? <laughs> the yeah. Kind of, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the hair, the, the braids and so forth. And uh, in the American copies, uh, the words talking book were in Braille as well. So, you, you know. Because the talking book was a kind of an audio book, wasn't it? It for, was an for, audio for the book. That, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. You know, they're books for the blind. And, but um, don't you think the electronic textures of it were incredibly oh, interesting? Do you think that you know that actually things like "Here Come the Warm Jets" that wasn't until 1974. Uh, Kraftwerk had an album in 1970, but it wasn't really till Autobahn '74 that they were kind of really influential. Whereas on this record in 1972, uh, were all these extraordinary uh, synthesized tones, which which became in some ways the kind of foundation of a lot of electronic music from there on in, didn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, they, they were using you know, synthesizers in a kind of lyrical, warm way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I was play, I played it yesterday. This and um, it's kind of odd in all kinds of ways. "You Are the Sunshine of My Life" is a really odd opener for an album. It's it's kind of really wandery, you know. But yeah, but you know, clearly enormously popular. And, and the track that I found myself loving when I played it yesterday is "You've Got a Bad Girl." Uh, at the end of the first side. And, of course, the superstition, which we've all kind of heard, you know, in the, if you haven't heard the uh, the original kind of unmixed version of superstition, go and look on YouTube and you'll find it. It's absolutely astonishing to hear the way he played that. Yeah, you, you know, hear all the different parts. He, all the it's different astonishing. parts. Astonishing. Which he did himself. It's an amazing, amazing piece of work. And isn't it amazing? That's what I was thinking yesterday, that there is no kind of deluxe edition of this record with kind of outtakes. And and there must have been outtakes, mustn't there? You know, whereas this is the same weekend where we've had Revolver, you know, in the box. Yeah. With all the, all the stuff that didn't get released and whatever. And that applies to most kind of rock records, isn't it? That's what people do with them. Motown haven't done that at all, have they? I don't think. No, I don't have. think they have, and that's a goldmine, surely. Cause it's surely, truth be for the for the Beatles, my you, God, you, that Revolver thing is selling like hotcakes, isn't it? It's astonishing. So I tell you, what, my thought about Revolver, I was I was listening to it yesterday, and um, <laughs> I never know what to think about kind of remixing and remastering all these things. That you you suddenly make things prominent that were not necessarily prominent before, and so. And so you hear the cowbell on Taxman. Taxman. It starts start, to over, overtake it, doesn't it? It's, you yeah. start to get obsessed with it. Yeah, because yeah. You, because you, you know, your attention is drawn to it. But I tell you, the other thing that struck me, I was listening to it, we were coming home from friends last night, I was playing it in the car. 
And I'll tell you what's amazing. Taxman is a really good example of this. It's an unusual way to start a record as a George Harrison song, you know. It's a very kind of, you know, of its time sniping song about tax rates or whatever. But it's it's kind of uh, towards the end, you know, you have the, you have the last chorus and then they they are frankly rocking out, aren't they? And yet it fades so quickly. Very quickly. Really quickly. It's that McCartney solo. And you think to yourself, any group after that doing that would play it longer. And so you think within, you know, I don't know, so that's made in 66. When's Neil's Young, Neil Young's Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere made? It's two or three years later, isn't it? Where basically the whole point of music was get to that pitch and then keep going. Yeah? Yeah. Whereas with the Beatles, it wasn't. It was, you got the pitch? Fine. Okay, next. Move on. And that's the amazing thing about, about Revolver is the level of invention which is condensed into really kind of really brief tracks. And uh, again, as I've said this before, the amazing thing to me about Tomorrow Never Knows is how fast it is. Yeah. Whereas I was listening to... Um, and then it's Phil, all on one note. It's Phil Collins' version of it the other day. And, and that, again, is just slower. Everything trance-like after that started to be slower and slower and slower. So music increasingly became about, about getting in moods and then staying in them for long periods of time. Whereas the Beatles were not about that at all. They were about, here's a mood, here's another mood, here's a different one, you know? Very different way of making records. Completely different. How do you feel when you hear those remixes of Revolver? It's, I think it's funny, it's fantastic to hear Taxman, where it's so crisp and it's so separated, you can hear all the instruments and you can just feel the different components very clearly. But I don't remember that as being how the record sounded at all. Because, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, I either heard it on the dance set or I heard it on the radio yeah. or I heard it at parties. And my, my, my memory of that sound is completely different to, to what the remixes sound like, don't you think? Yeah, well, you can. Yeah, but also the equipment that you played it on. Was, yeah, absolutely, was, was different, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, it was you, designed you, for different. Well, you bought a mono copy, didn't you? Like, yeah, you know, nobody had a stereo copy revolver. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, I never heard a stereo copy of that for years and years and years. And um, and you heard it on, you know, you heard it on AM radio, and you you heard it through, as you say, a down set or whatever. Or you might hear tracks from it on a jukebox. And so, you know, the, all, all music is, is appreciated in the technology of the time, isn't it? it when is. you move it into another era, it never quite sounds the same because, you know, the, the air has changed, doesn't it? <laughs> you know? um, and I, I, I never know whether we're, whether we're trying to get back to something or go forward to something. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I like hearing these things, but uh, you know they never kind of kind of replace the original to my mind. Because I can't actually, hear Taxman any uh, uh, now without thinking of the fact that it was a McCartney solo, which I didn't. I only discovered that reasonably recently. You know that uh, I always thought it was George Harrison solo, but he couldn't do it. And then I mean, he'd spent two hours trying to record that solo. I think George Martin said, "Why don't you just when well, let someone else have a go? Let Paul have a go." Paul came in and 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 in his first take produced that extraordinary solo. And George then left the studio for two hours. He was so upset and wound up about it. You can understand. Maybe that's why it was faded so fast. It didn't want to draw attention to it. Didn't want to draw attention to it, exactly. Bad uh, memory. It's possible. But, you know, you have all these versions of these records, and the truth is the most powerful version is the one that you've got inside your head, isn't it? Yeah. That's that's the one you carry around with you from when you first hear it, you know. Um, and and nothing changes that at all. That's so why you, you get all these, you know, new versions, all these remixes, whatever. But never, they never supplant the original, do they really? No, not at all. 
You the thing I like about those remix uh, things is, is the outtakes. The outtakes are what interests me. is hearing John Lennon playing a waltz version of Yellow Submarine on acoustic guitar. That's really interesting. But the remixes, I don't think, makes that much difference, really. That's not what I'm looking for. No, no, no. But anyway, I think also what people like and shouldn't be underestimated, what people like is buying again something they've already got. Yeah. The people get enormous pleasure because they know they there. can't possibly be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like watching movies you've already seen ten times. It is. You know, it's there's like, no risk involved. It's like, would you like to play ten times as much for it? Yes, please. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to have it. I'd like to have it appeared, you know, in a, in, a, in a presentation case and all that. Yeah, Ooh, I love all that. You know, I can see why people do it. Nothing wrong with that at all. The word podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. So, any other business? We're joined by Alex Gold. Hello, Alex. Hello. Have you got pyjamas on? I haven't. I've got a paisley shirt on, oh, actually. Okay. And uh, it does look very jammerish, though, and some, some tastefully rich, ripped, ripped jeans. Oh, yeah, ripped. OK. All right. I bought some pre-ripped jeans in in Primani in. Um, well, you actually bought. They looked like that when they when you bought them, didn't they? With, with yeah, the symmetrical the rips on, on the knees. I've I've actually got a, a rip just below the groin now as well. Which so which when do you what, what stage in life can you not wear pre-ripped jeans? <laughs> I, think I'm, I think I'm pushing it. Whatever stage it is, I'm I'm very much pushing Getting it. Getting close to it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holding out for as long as I can. Thirty nine yeah. and holding. Thirty nine yeah. and holding, holding everything you can. Uh, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful record, the, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, so, uh, what's new, Alex? We've got our Christmas Christmas social coming up on November the November fourteenth, fourteenth, and uh, it's open to our top tier Patreon subscribers yes. only. Yeah. So, if you're not already subscribed, please do. Please uh, do. Secret London, Secret Central London location to be revealed <laughs> shortly. Where if will they want... get the info about that magic? And how to uh, uh, apply? They'll get it from, from me directly. So yeah, you via, RSVP via Patreon, and I will furnish you with the details yeah. um, in due course. I love the word furnish. Furnish um, is good. It's a great word. So, to feel better. Okay, new Patreons, uh, Alex, because we did say that yes. we have, have new Patreons. We would we would give them their place in some fantasy TV listings. Of our own devising, <laughs> they're all they're all TV presenters of some kind. Oh, we're, going to, we're going to assign them correspondents, producers, whatever yeah. they can they can appear somewhere in the Radio Times. Right here we go, Alex. Who have we got? Okay, first up, we've got Mark Wait. Right, W A Y T. Mark Wait, we think rugby league. He's doing rugby league. Rugby on league Sky. commentary. He's doing it on think. Sky. Yeah, he is. He's, That's a, good. he's reporting for Wigan or Warrington. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving on. Who have we got next? Richard Terry. Richard Terry, I know exactly where Richard Terry is. Richard Terry's a lobby correspondent. He's he's one of those guys that's been very <laughs> yeah. busy in the last few weeks, standing there in the lobby interviewing mad members of parliament and trying to hold it all together. Carry on. Mark Burrell. Mark Burrell. Mark is, Burrell. Ooh, is that the, a repair shop person, maybe? Oh, that's a good Could thing. Could be. Mark Burrell, probably a woodworker in the repair yes, shop, I think. Very Could be. good. I like Very it. Very good. Next. The uh, humbly named Sir Tainley Noak Lou. We think that there, was, there might have been a joke in here somewhere. It could be certainly no clue. <laughs> it's the gag. <laughs> with, I think he's a member of the Bonzo Dog Band who got away. Yeah. So he would have appeared in Do Not Adjust Your Set in 1967. And now should be hosting Blankety Blank or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Luke. Luke Byhet. Luke Byhet. You, you L-U-C. You see. Celebrity L-U-C. chef. Celebrity chef. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Go on. Okay, next Everything up is flumber. James Bennett. James Bennett's on top gear when they're running out of normal presenters. <laughs> yeah. He's a stand-in. <laughs> If somebody's got a cold, James yeah. Bennett is in, is in there. He's doing a final uh, farewell celebration of the Ford Anglia this week. Yeah. I think that's what he's doing. <laughs> Go on. James Carter. 
James Carter. Historian. I think historian, don't you? Oh, yeah, you think he's trying James yeah. Carter is wandering across the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the battlefield of, of Culloden Moor. James Carter appears in the distance coming across a ploughed field, doesn't he, towards yeah. the camera. And he when does. he reaches you, it points out you're on... You're in the site of the Battle of Agincourt. Or That's whatever. right. That's what he does. Who else have we got? Tim Kellaway. Tim Kellaway is, again, we always have to have somebody who's presenting on CBBs, probably in a yellow jumpsuit. <laughs> That's Tim Kellaway. Playing a ukulele. <laughs> yes. Totally cheery. And finally, last but certainly not least, we have Paul Kent. Paul Kent is a Paul financial Kent. financial reporter. Yeah. Uh, he's the person who tells you about it's the sort of like your mortgage woes. Yeah, it tell you the turmoil in the markets now. It's going to affect your mortgage. <laughs> so if you'd like to, you know, if you'd like to be cast similarly in our fantasy kind of radio times, you know, sign on as a Patreon supporter. Why don't you go to patreon.com slash word in your ear and find out how you might get involved. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. <laughs> <laughs>